Okay, so let's start po. So, uh, wait lang po. I-test lang po namin yung PowerPoint po muna. Kung mag, ano po. Yan po. Okay lang po ba? Nakikita okay niyo po. po. Okay naman po. Thank you po. Okay po. Yung ano po ni Father, okay lang po ba yung view niya po? Okay naman po. Ayan, sige po. Sakto po yan. Yes po. Thank you so much po. Okay po. So, thank you everyone for joining us in this episode of the Intramural Learning Session. So, this is our 74th episode. And this episode is brought to you by the Intramuros Administration in partnership with Apoleo de Santa Rosa. And uh, of course, this is your host, Rancho Arcelia. Now, before we start, uh, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Uh, Father, okay lang po ba i-off muna po natin yung share screen? Okay, off ko na muna. Okay, thank you po. Yeah. Before we start po, I'd like to invite uh, the the head of the Culeo de Santa Rosa Intramuros community, uh, Sister Vicente Clima, Clim, Climacosa for uh, a short welcome, uh, warm welcome, welcome message. <laughs> Sister? Oh, I think she's uh, frozen. Okay, so while waiting for her, I'll uh, read out first our usual house rules. So for this webinar, if you want to raise your uh, questions, you have the Q&A button below the screen. You also have the chat button. So feel free to uh, use these buttons if you have any questions or comments. If you are viewing via Facebook Live, you can also key in your questions in the comment section below and then I will, I'm going to monitor them as we go through this webinar. Take note that only those who have successfully registered and viewed on Zoom will be eligible to get a certificate and the feedback form will be emailed to you after the session. The certificate will be sent within a week. Now, if you are viewing via Zoom now and you wish to get a certificate, we can still accept participants via Zoom. So feel free to register na muna po via Zoom so that you can view us here in this platform. And note that this webinar is recorded and that the recording will be made, uh, made permanently available in our social media channels. And of course, just a reminder din po, if you are viewing via Zoom, take note that your names will appear sa mga other participants and of course if you ask any questions may greet ka po other participants uh, but pwede naman po sabihin na you wish to remain unknown so that hindi ko na lang po banggitin yung pangalan ninyo okay so before I introduce our celebrated speaker I'd like to call on the head of the Puleje de Santa Rosa community in Intramuros Sister Vicente Clemo Klimakosa for a short welcome message. Sister? Good afternoon. Afternoon po. Uh, today we are gathered uh, as an online community in this learning session webinar organized by Intramuros Administration primarily to explore and widen our knowledge of Culeo de Santa Rosa Intramuros history, heritage, and legacy. We who are living in Intramuros, or even wider in a sense, that the school's existence uh, back way back uh, 272 years of existence, belonging even to the 10 oldest schools in the Philippines, it's highly to note that it's part of the provider of Catholic education in the Philippines. Way back to the time, it was founded for and now that the vision of Mother Paula de la Santissima Trinidad was continuously done, I warmly welcome you all to this webinar and sharing. May we all take this as a learning experience, a step that will open for more steps for of vision, mission, and service. So welcome po sa atin lahat and then magandang hapon po. 
Thank you, sister, for that uh, message. It was a very warm message. Maraming salamat po. And we are honored. We at Intramuros Administration are highly honored to be partnering with you uh, on this episode of the Intramuros Learning Session. So it's about time that we feature the Poleri Santa Rosa in our platform. Of course, I'd like to greet the community of the Poleri Santa Rosa and Intramuros in the screen of uh, Sister Eva Gray. So hello po sa ating mga, uh, mga audience there na nanonood. So we are very happy po that you can come and uh, join us in this webinar. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. So our speaker for this afternoon is very much a, a celebrated church historian. No? So we have Father Emil Kilatan, who is a priest and historian uh, at the Order of the Agustin Recollects in the province of St. Ezekiel Moreno. He studied philosophy at the Casiquiaco Recoletos Seminary in Baguio City and Theology at the Recoletos Formation Center in Quezon City. He has a licensiate as well as a doctorate in church history from the Pontifical Gregorian University. He professed his vows, vows as an Augustinian Recollect in 1986 and was ordained a priest in 1992. A prolific author, he, was, he has authored and co-authored numerous publications and previously, previously served as dean at the Recoletos School of Theology and has also taught church history at the San Carlos Graduate School of Theology, UST Central Seminary, and at the Immaculate Conception Seminary in Giging Bulacan. He is presently the archives administrator of the Archivo Recoletos. So we are very proud to present to you Father Emil. Father? Good afternoon to all. Afternoon, Father. Good afternoon. So allow me to share with you with this uh, research that I did about the history, heritage, and legacy of Cole de Santa Rosa in Tramuros. No? And what you see in the, we might say, the screen, no? there are, there are, there were, there have been no? four, and we might say, groups of religious women who administered the Colegio. And the first one were the Dominican tertiaries, followed by the Daughters of Charity, then the Servants of St. Joseph, and finally, the, currently, no, the Agustinian Recollect Sisters of the Philippines. So what was, in, uh, allow me to say the limitation of my research, because remember the Cole de Santa Rosa began as a Beaterio in Intramuros, no? And it would attach specification that it is also the Casa de Enseñanza, no? the, a school for girls no? specified by the colonial government at that time. And the foundress was a Dominican tertiary. That's why that's difficult for me because I could not delve into the primary sources, but I had to contend with the available secondary sources that we have in the archives. So what is interesting to note, it begins as a beaterio. That's why in the Spanish period, no, it is always located in the Dominican complex of Intramuros that is in the, no, uh, going and facing the, um, we might say Pasig River. No, you see at the center, be, beside the words LL, double L is the, of course, the former site of the first Dominican church and convent of Intramuros, Santo Domingo. Below the LL is the Colegio de Santa Rosa. And facing Colegio de Santa Rosa is the former site of the old University of Santo Tomas. So this is a map dating back in the 18th century. So it is old. It's old in Intramuros. No? That's like if you look at the map of 1851, you look at number, we might say 21. No? That is, uh, that is uh, the, we might say, this one, number 21. That is the, the house and lot of the Colegio de Santa Rosa. No? Uh, then we might say above it is Santo Domingo and facing facing San, the Santa Rosa is this one is still UST. So the site did not change up to now. No, it did not change the site. Okay. 
So uh, allow me to stress the point that the Beaterio was only one of the definitely start the, the, as, a, as a Casa de Recogimiento, but it evolved into a Beaterio with essentially the same structure as other Beaterios of Manila and its suburbs. suburbs no? That's why there were three Beaterios in Intramuros. The first one was the RVM Sisters under Mother Ignacia del Espiritu Santo. Then the Beatel de Santa Catalina, no, beside Letran, no, was founded by Francis, Mother Francisca del Espiritu Santo. And the third one is the Beaterio de Santa Rosa de Lima. No? It was founded between 1570 and 1866. No? And this was founded by a lay woman, a tertiary no, from Spain. No? Calva Tarragona, so she's a Catalan no, from Catalonia. Madre Maria Paula de la Santissima Trinidad. No? And she belonged to a rich family. And what was interesting because of her spirituality and ascetical life, no, she's the eldest among the daughters. She renounced everything. Uh, she, her mother died early and he was, she was taken care of by the father together with her younger sister. And she decided to live a life of asceticism and dedicated his life of virginity for the Lord with charitable and spiritual works of mercy. So she renounced everything and gave her, we might say, inheritance to her younger sister. And in spite of her, no noble and rich background. No? She went to Lerida, where she applied as a maid no, of the house to learn how to work and discipline herself. And in Lerida, the owner of the house no, saw the charism of Madre Maria Paula no? and, and started, started her the catechetical instruction of, of the workers working in her in his in his, in his fields, so, which was success, successful. No? And he has, she had to walk every day for one hour to go to Mass and receive Holy Communion. And this was taken notice by the Bishop of Tarragona. So the Bishop invited her to become a tertiary and told her of her gifts that she is not for the cloistered life. So sinabi hindi siya, ang buhay niya hindi pwedeng maging madre, maging third order ka because you have things to do for the Lord. And she went to Manresa for her spiritual exercises and, of course, no, decided to go to the Philippines. No? And in, in her plans, she faced many obstacles. No? That's why in spite of this, her trust in the Lord, she was able to reach Mexico. And while waiting for the galleon that would bring them to the Philippines, she encountered a group of Dominicans also waiting for the right wind so that the galleon might uh, lead them to bring them to Manila. So, so she left Cadiz, arrived in Manila no, via Mexico, and three and a half years later, on July 15, she lost no time guarding destitute girls of all races. Kaya nga, she has she had this charism of no, gathering, we might say, orphans and children, street children, no, under her care. And she began teaching them Spanish and the four R's, no, writing, reading, and rhythmic and the Christian religion and doctrine. And because of that, no, because of her apostolate, no, there was a, we might say, a benefactress by the name of Marquesa de Monte Castro and uh, Liana, Liana Hermosa, no? Who was also the benefactress of the Beatriz de Santa Risa de Pasig, no? gave Mother Paula her house, no? the house facing UST. Thus began the, we might say, the Beatriz de Santa Rosa de Lima. That's why the owner of the adjoining house and that Don Francisco Salgado no? gave also the extended property that expanded the Beatriz. They were benefactors because they were, we might say, inspired by Mother Paula no? and was able to buy a third house that would extend no? 
the city for her uh, in the, the world city for her wards. Then the Dominicans tried to integrate her work with that of the Beatel de Santa Catalina by reportedly offering her the position of prioress in the latter institution, but she begged off because she was thinking more in terms of a school for native girls rather than a beaterio. So her detractors, however, taunted her as being more interested in styling herself as foundress than in working with poor girls. That's why Mother Paula began to vie no, for this an accusation that it is not true. That's why for 32 years, of love and labor and sacrifice, she dedicated her life for the education of the girls in, in, in Manila. That's why during the British invasion, no, she was fearless, no, fearless when the British raped Manila in 1762. All young women and even her students no, were protected by her. So she even faced the soldiers no, and defended the girls. No? And one of them, one of the soldiers, who attempted to violate a girl, a student, no? and the student resisted. She was about to be, we might say, struck by a sword. The sword no? levitated and bent. No? And because of what the soldiers saw, she uh, the soldier ran away. That's why this sword was a precious relic of the, of the event that happened in 1762. It disappeared when um, when, the, when Santa Rosa was destroyed during World War II, during the liberation. So after the British left Manila, no, she wrote to, later to the king, that was Charles III, imploring for royal recognition and protection as the Casa de Enseñanza or school. So it was given. Knowing the royal temper regarding the Philippine Beaterio, she promised that her foundation would never turn into a nunnery, La Monjia or a beaterio, and his bears would not take any vows. No? She proudly noted that some of the students have returned to the respective towns in Tagalog and Pampango provinces to serve as teachers of Spanish, Christian doctrine, and other subjects that they had learned from her school. That's why this is our first, we may say, training ground of teachers no? in the Spanish period, women. And they, it's, it is, they are so, that, that's the, the Beaterio, which became the Casa de Enseñanza, became, we might say, under the protection of the king to see to it that all barrios and towns would have professional native teachers. That was the aim of the new foundation when, even though it, it is run by the third order, they were called Beatas, they are not promoting the Beata spiritual rather than, rather than forming women to become teachers. Again, in 1765, Madre Paula further requested the king that her house give the, for license for an oratory or chapel so, with the, so the girls can make their confession, hear mass, and receive Holy Communion instead of walking back and forth to the Church of Santo Domingo. Okay? The archbishop at that time, Bishop Basilio de Santas Justas Irofina, Supported their play, but the royal audience objected to them, observing that there were more than enough religious houses or schools for women in Manila and its suburbs. However, the king of Spain, the same king, Charles III, supported Mother Paula and ordered the maintenance of a chapel in Santa Rosa during her lifetime. Okay. In her last will and testament on June 2, 1782, Mother Paula named her first pupil, Hermana Ignacia de Guzman de la Santísima Trinidad, a successor in the Casa de Enseñanza de Manila. Most probably a Spanish Manileña, Hermana Ignacia was a Dominican tertiary like Mother Paula, as well all as the Beatas running the school. And the Beatas also begged the Archbishop and the Audiencia to allow their school to continue after her death, which occurred shortly on June 16, 1782. The sympathetic audience thus informed the king of the impossibility of transferring the students of Madre Paul to other institutions and the vital importance of continuing her foundation. That's why the king allowed no, the continuation of the Casa de Enseñanza. You know? That's why by 1788, with the together with its rules and regulation, her institution, founded by Mother Paula, was 
Beaterio y Casa de Enseñanza de Manila and submitted to them to the king the following years. That's why with this rules and regulation, Santa Rosa became a Cas Beaterio because it was done by the third order Dominicans, women, and these women were also teaching the girls in the Casa de Enseñanza. Okay. The Dominican church living together in God, like other beatrice, their house was indeed a bit in spirit and in practice, if not officials or recognized. Besides, the other beatrice were also cast as the recogimiento, that is, in the royal, it is a house of prayer and recollection for women. No? In effect, there were two colleges of beatrice of the Dominican order in Manila, that of Santa Catalina and that of Santa Rosa. That's why. Santa Rosa, no, the as a casa was within the Dominican enclave, no, of the of the of Intramuros. That's why, no. Mother Igna, uh, Hermana Ignacia, there is the Santissima, the La Santissima was called Senora Maisa or Lady Mistress Teacher, no, but she's not a prioress, no. She was a uh, teacher and. Uh, by assisted by 12 Dominican Beatas tertiaries in order teaching in teaching the girls in the school. That's why the, in, it is in advanced and conduct and dedicated to a life of chastity apostleship that the Beatas, not the third orders, no lay women, who dedicated themselves for the formation of young girls. No? So Remember, the Beaterio spirituality was also a dominant spirituality in the Spanish colonies, no? especially in the Philippines, where native women who could not become nuns in the, the only canonical monastery in Manila, that was, or that is, no? at that time, no? the Monastery of Santa Clara, no? they began this way of life called the Beaterio spirituality. They were not religious, they were not lay women, Yet they live like religious, no? and they were given royal protection by the king of Spain. So when they're given royal protection, the Archbishop of Manila and the Governor General are, cannot touch the Beatas because they were under the protection of the king of Spain. That's why the king of Spain, with the royal, with the royal protection, provided the Beatas and the Beaterio protection that they could not be visited by the archbishop and second they could not be taxed no by the colonial government and the third we might say privilege that they were given that that they could take the simple vows as a religious only at the point of death okay so the emergence of the beatrice began when mother ignacia was succeeded by Sor Petrona Tuason, a wealthy Dominican tertiary in 1812, no? and she sold her hacienda in Nagtahan, near Santa Mesa, and it's imposing house of for 7,000 to expand the Casa de Enseñanza titulada de la, de la Madre Paula. No? So what you see is an expansion of the Devita into a school. And the last Beata, no? was Doña uh, Angela de los Santos, no? died in 1866. She was the last Beata or third order because the school was run between uh, from 1786 to 1866 by a group of third order, uh, Dominican third order women. And with her death, no? the board of directors presided by the regent of the audience took over and offered the administration of the Casa de Enseñanza to the Daughters of Charity. So from 1866 to 1941, the Casa de Enseñanza was entrusted to the daughters, the Spanish Daughters of Charity. Thus, when the Daughters of took over, it was formally renamed Coleo de Santa Rosa de Lima. That was in 1866. And it continued the, the, the mission vision of the foundress, Madre Paula de la Santissima, the, the education and formation of Christian girls in, the, in Manila. 
Tasi from Beta de Santa to Corre de Santa Rosa was very important because the board of directors entrusted it to the Daughters of Charity. That's why no, the pictures that we are seeing today in the, in, the, in the publications of Intramuros were taken in the 1920s. And this was under the administration of the Daughters of Charity. But when the Daughters of Charity took over the Cole de Santa Rosa, the building that they inherited from the board of directors was in a ruinous condition because of the earthquake of 1863. So by begging, asking for donations, they were able to rebuild the school, but in 1882, it was destroyed. Again, this time, with the help of the board of directors, they were able to rebuild the school and expanded it no? facing UST. So this is the 1930, we might say, uh, the whole complex of Santa Rosa, Colida Santa Rosa, uh, uh, facing uh, adjacent to the University of Santo Tomas. So this is the picture around 60, 1920. The internas, these are the uh, the one who are the girl border, the border student borders, having their calisthenics outside of the colegio. Now this was 19, and of course under the watchful eye of the daughters of charity. Now they're looking at the to, to the, their, their borders. No? This is the dormitory for the, for the internas or borders no? taken in 1920, yet under the uh, administration of the Daughters of Charity. And this is the reception hall, again, 1920 picture under the, we might say, watchful eye of the sister, all visitors no? who, who would visit the interna, relatives or friends, were under the watchful care of the sisters. No? What was interesting, they really take care of the purity of their borders, no? as if they were also already candidates for the sisterhood. Okay. So, sadly, the Cole de Santa Rosa de Lima was destroyed. No? Even the early, we might say, uh, 1941, December, it was uh, raised to the ground by bombs. And it was ruined during the liberation of, of, uh, of 1944, February. No? So in spite of the, we might say, uh, ruinous condition, again, the board of directors, again, restored the Cole de Santa Rosa. Okay? And there were two outstanding alumni of the Colegio. No? And we know already that one of the alumni was Doña Teodora Alonso Iquintos. No? And uh, to, to summarize her life as a Rosenian, no? Dr. Jose Rizal paid tribute to his mother with an ex and when, he, uh, when he wrote this memoir. Ah, without her, what would have been my fate? After God, the mother is everything to man. So for Rizal, everything is coming from the mother, no, was dedicated for the upbringing of Rizal and all her children, no, 11 of them. The rest were girls and two were boys. We know that one of the boys was Pasiano Rizal. No? So this is the very in, most, uh, most important alumni of the, of, of the, we might say, of the of the Cole de Santa Rosa and in the, in the, in the years in, uh, during the peacetime under the Daughters of Charity, another one was Carmen Planas, the first woman counselor of Manila, was also an outstanding alumna of her period. Again, a Prada uh, Arosenian of Intramuros. Okay, the school was burned on December 27, 1941. And it was reconstructed afterwards. So in 1948, the Daughters of Charity did not accept the administration. It was entrusted to the Sierbas de San Jose. Okay, from 1948. And in, that, in 1964, the branch, the Colegio de Santa Rosa branch, was opened in Makati in Estrella Street. No? And in 1981, the Augustinian Recollect Sisters received the invitation to take over the two schools, Santa Rosa de Intramuros and Santa Rosa de Makati, 
which they accepted. Okay. And during their administration, the two, two uh, Santa Rosa schools were opened, one in Tres Cabite in 1997, and one in Puerto Princes. I do not know the date, so I'm the question around 2019 or 2018. I'm not so sure. Okay. So what is the legacy of this, we might say, Coleo de Santa Rosa? It is the motto. No? The motto, Quasi Plantatio Rose in Jericho. Okay. That's the complete verse taken from Ecclesiastes. Or we might say, uh, Book of Sirach from the Doe Reims version. This is the legacy of the, of the school. Why? What is the symbolism of the red rose? The red rose symbolizes passion, love, devotion, and sacrifice. That's the biblical symbolism of the red rose. But what is interesting, it, it is not just a red rose, it is a desert rose that survives even during the driest season. So this is called the Rose of Jericho, Anastas Anastatica Yerokun. No? It is a very a rose that it survives during the dry season and it gives it, it renews itself even though the, there was there would be minimal water. That's why the rose of Jericho, which is the symbol of the school, is the legacy that was given by Mother Paula de la Santissima Trinidad to all who would enter its halls, the students. Because the original rose of Jericho is a small one, a flowering plant, no? only 12 inches. And interestingly, people would also it to be a tumbleweed due to its incredible resistance to drying out. Hindi to nalalanta. It can survive in extremely dry climates. When exposed to a desert-like environment, the little moisture, the rose of Jericho curls into a dry bowl similar to a tumbleweed. In this form, it hibernates to protect its flowers on the inside, and does it this and, and does this until the, it receives water. When it receives, it will open up, and you will see the beautiful flower covering the thumb by the it's it's a seeming like dry, uh, we might say, uh, branches. This repeating process of hibernation has earned the rose of Jericho the name the resurrection plant. It symbolizes transformation, renewal, and not surprisingly, they also see the death and resurrection of Christ in its ability to die and then recover. Santa Rosa with the rose, symbolism of the, with its motto, no? Quasi plantatio rose. The students are I might say, revival, no? resiliency, whenever they are assigned in every status of their life and they're the instruments of Christ's resurrection. For example, in the case of Teodora Alonso, she was persecuted. She was forced to walk 50 kilometers from Calamba to Santa Cruz Laguna. And she endured prison for two years and a half. Yet she did not lose hope and she did not lose her faith. And she, that was resiliency like the Rose of Jericho that once liberated, she was able to extend her love for her children and continue guiding their children until she died in 1911. There was, we might say, heartache. There were heartaches, but she, was, she did not turn against the church. She did not uh, stop going to mass, and yet she persevered. So this is the symbolism of the Rose of Jericho Hopefully that all the alumni of San Cole de Santa Rosa, of all its different school branches, will become the instrument of re resiliency, revival, and resurrection in spite of the, we might say, trials they face in, the, in this life. Let us be reminded, no, my dear friends, no, we are here to carry the cross, and it's our Christian vocation. To suffer with the cross has its meaning because behind the cross is the resurrection, like the dry Jericho, rolls of Jericho. But what was worse, if we suffer, if we do not know the meaning of suffering and we lost the cross in our lives, and that is the tragedy of those who have forgotten.
the symbolism of the Rose of Jericho in their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for that very informative webinar. Uh, the Coleo de Santa Rosa has been in existence for almost 300 years now, since it has been in existence since 1750. Now, uh, the Coleo is truly an inspiration for all of us. And of course, thank you for presenting the history and legacy of the Coleo in this webinar. Now, we are going to uh, open the open forum to our participants. Now, if you are in uh, the Zoom uh, platform, feel free to uh, uh, ask your question. <clears throat> Sorry, ask your questions in the chat button below your screen, or we also have a QA and a button. And for our viewers in Facebook, I'm also monitoring the comment section. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, key in your questions in the comment section so I can raise them on air as we go along. Now, Father, uh, during the very long existence of the Colegio, during its almost 300 years of existence, many other institutions have risen and have fallen. Now, but the Colegio has remained standing despite uh, what happened, earthquakes, wars, disasters. Now, Father, to what do you attribute the Colegio's longevity? I think the longevity of the Coleo is the resiliency of those who administered the Coleo. Resiliency. Resiliency that they would be able to overcome the trials they face. Because remember, no, if you are doing the apostate for God, God will send us, no, we might say, um, trials in order to purify our motives. If you really serve him, we are being purified by him through this pandemic especially. And how do we respond to this trial? That it depends upon the administrators of the colegio. Administrators. Because remember, they're doing the work of God. And they glorify God in the way they work in, through the education of the young. Remember, you know, like the Rose of Jericho, no? there should be a resurrection spirit in every trial that we face, yet adapt to the needs of the time. So that's why later on, the Coleo was open to boys. It became a co-education institution. So it was responding because education is for all. And Jose Rizal, the, mad, the, 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 the son of Teodoro Alonso, would always remind us through liberation, comes in education. And the thing that we have to be aware of that this education is the formation of Christian conscience. Theodora Alonso, Carmen Planas, and the rest of the alumni who walk, who pass through that, the halls of Colegio de Santa Rosa, no, I believe that they have received the formation of Christian conscience. And this is the main apostate of all Christian, Catholic Christian schools. Uh, so one thing about this is that liberation through education must be the emphasis of the apostolate. Because the worst thing that would happen is that ignorance will be the one to destroy the apostolate. Thank you, Father, for that uh, uh response and that message and I'm sure na sagutan na rin itong question ni Angelo na what is the most important lesson that we can get from institutions so thank you father now uh, the Coleo all throughout its existence have transferred from owner to owner so it transferred to the daughters of charity then it transferred to the sisters of St. Joseph then right now to the Augustine Recollects now despite uh, those different transfers in ownership. How do you think the Coleo was able to preserve a single identity? The single identity is found in the motto. Without the motto, there will be no single identity. No? Resiliency through Christian faith, through the resurrection. 
So we don't use the word owners administrators from one administrator to another of the different congregation because the when she, when the when Mother Paula died and the last the last Beata died, no, it was turned over to the board of directors of the Archdiocese of Manila, no, and the board of directors, no, in order to continue the spirit of the foundress, were the ones running the Beaterio with the with the, uh, with the aid of the sisters that they were um, asked no, to administer the Biaterio on the behalf of the board of members. And one of the members of the board of directors is a recollect. No? No? The rec no? Because when I was, we might say, a seminarian, I noticed there were Spaniards who were procurators who were attending some activities, no? a part birthday party. And they were, when I was in for, they were members of the board of directors of the Santa Rosa Foundation. Okay. So they are the ones maintaining the identity of the colegio in spite of the turnover to the different administrators. That's why, no, quasi plantatio rose is the motto. How did the motto, I, I'm trying to delve it, I could not, when it, when it began, maybe under the Daughters of Charity, no? But I could surmise that, no? the identity of the rose, the rose of Jericho should teach us the lesson that in spite of the trials that we face every day, and we know that God is with us, we could survive these trials. Mm -hmm. And the most concrete example that I could give was the life of Doña Teodora Alonso. Uh, she was an example of the Rosenian identity. She's an icon, a perfect icon of the Rosenian identity that ever passed through the halls of Colegio Santa Rosa de Intramuros. Thank you, Father. Now, uh, we have an anonymous uh, attendee here. Uh, he's asking about the relationship between the Colegio and the Archbishop of Manila during the Spanish era. Now, does the Archbishop have any influence in the mission of the Colegio de Santa Rosa to educate the young Filipino Catholics? Now, I think this refers to a period before the Board of Directors. Mm -hmm. What is the relationship out there? The board of directors uh, before uh, when uh, no, when Mother Paula the, the was alive, she was greatly admired and even respected by the Archbishop of Manila at that time. He was Archbishop Basilio Sancho de Santa Just, Santa's Justa Irofina. And this priest was also a promoter of Filipino vocations to the priesthood, this archbishop, no. So uh, the influence is rather minimal because they were under the royal protection when Mother Paula was alive. Mm -hmm. When she died, it passed through a board of directors, no? uh, we might say uh, to be handed by 12 members of the Beatas living in the Beaterio. And they were under the guidance of the Archbishop. The Archbishop cannot interfere because they were under royal protection. Only the, she, she, the, Archbishop, the Archbishop could guide the Beatas. That is why the, found, the board of the, was later created when the last Beata died in order to continue the legacy of Mother Paula de la Santissima Trinidad. So the Archbishop has a spiritual force behind the Beaterio because of the veneration that this Archbishop Manila had when Mother Paula was alive at that time. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say because remember, during the Spanish regime, no, the last say in all church discipline and policy was not the Archbishop, the King of Spain, because he's the patron, the benefactor of the church in the colony. So he, he had always the last say and the Archbishop of Manila and the Governor General were just appointees of the King of Spain. That's why what the King you know, decree would be obey, obeyed by both. That's why when the Royal, when you talk about the, this, the Royal Audiencia is a consultant advisory body of the Governor General. It's like the Supreme Court at that time. They could even overrule the Archbishop and the Governor General. But when the King opposed the royal audience, the royal audiencia, no, obeyed the policy. They allow, no, to open an oratory in the colegio for the students to attend holy mass and hear confession every month. So the king of Spain had always the last say with regard to policies, no. Only the archbishop and the general and the royal audiencia 
have only, we might say, a minimal, we might say, decision once the king of Spain decides otherwise. Okay, that will be all for now. Thank you, Father. Now, when the Colegio was established in 1750, uh, what form did that establishment take? Was it through the form of an act of foundation, a royal charter, or is there a constitution? Or okay, so what is important, I said the king of Spain is the one doing a royal decree. So we have to look for the royal decree that officially gives the birth of the Colegio de Santa Rosa as a Beatero and the Casa de Enseñanza. Only the royal decree constitutes the beginning of the official foundation of the Beaterio, which later become, would become the Colegio. So it is a, it's not a charter, it's a decree only, no? written on paper sealed by the king's seal. No? So this determined the foundation of the Beaterio in 1750. So at that time, the king was, uh, I think, you know, uh, Charles III of Spain. You know? okay, that's the thing that we have to be aware of, always. That's why every parish during the Spanish period, every institution owe a lot to the decree of the king of Spain. Yeah. You know? The bishop will only prepare for the groundwork, for the separation of any part or any institution, but they had to wait for the royal decree that would guarantee the existence of any institution in the Philippines during the Spanish period, which we call the royal decree of the king, or he could delegate it to his governor general. Thank you, Father, for that. Now, uh, how would you, uh, this is from Zoom again, the, from our audience. How would you describe the curriculum of the Bioterio during the Spanish colonial government? Does the Beaterio taught embroidery and lace making, among others? Yes, no, because um, uh, following the example of Santa Rosa de Lima, Santa Rosa de Lima was, was uh, famous for her embroidery and lace making. No? So this is part of the curriculum, no? forming girls to be huh, future housewives and how to earn their keep. No? Mm -hmm. Aside from the four hours, no? and that is... Uh, Reading, writing, arithmetic, and Christian religion, they were given, and we might say, formation of how to become good women, Christian women, and most of future Christian wives. Mm -hmm. These are the things that the Colegio de Santa Rosa imbibed on their uh, students. Thank you, Father. Now, regarding the system of girls' schools in general in Intramuros during that time. Now, how would you describe the relationship between Santa Rosa and other uh, school for girls during the colonial era? Was there a network or did... So how would you describe that? It's hard to think because I could not delve uh, upon the relationship because it's already a detailed relationship now because mm -hmm. remember they are internas and they could not get out. They would only get out once they go to vacation. Mm -hmm. no? They, they, uh, they were not allowed to in have, we might say, contact with other institutions at that time. I'm just making a hypothesis because I, had, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. so I said the resources are very scarce. But based on the deduction, no, since they are internas, they could not get out. Mm -hmm. They could be accompanied by a sister whenever they are, or a relative during vacation. There was no such as a, the, the word we used to networking. There was none. No, there was none. But I could, uh, we might say, recall a alumna during the 1920s of how the colleges, the colegialas, the internas, participated the Lanabal procession. And they were really eager for the Lanabal. No? And all of them are this, this grand procession united all Manileños and even from the provinces. So this is the, this is the feast that united all of Manila is the Lanabal procession, according to that witness, a former alumna of Santa Rosa de Intramuros. But networking, I guess, there was no networking at that time. Mm -hmm. Everything is, has its own rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. That's all I could give for now. Uh, Father, we have also have another question from Zoom. Now, considering that so many religious orders moved out of Intramuros after World War II, why do you think the Colegio de Santa Rosa stayed? 
I cannot answer that because I don't have the documentation for that. No, mm -hmm. I don't have the whole documentation. No, UST move. Actually, UST moved its campus from Intramuros to what is now España, not 1925. No, Santo Domingo moved out. No, because of the war, the tragedy, and it had its new church in Quezon City. No, the same thing with with the I know with the San Beatriz Santa Catarina, but uh, Letran stayed. No? I do not know why. No, because many went out because of the tragedy of the liberation. Many died no? during the liberation. They were they were killed by the Japanese and became collateral damage during the liberation. No? So I cannot give you an exact reason why we maintain still the, the property in Intramuros after liberation. Hmm. No? I, I cannot give that answer for now because I don't have the documentation. Thank you, Father. Now we have a, an anonymous question again. So. What are the differences between the school curriculum then and now, so then versus now, in terms of forming consciences? Okay, the forming of Christian conscience will always remain the teaching of the Catholic religion, catechesis. Okay? Even though the curriculum differs from the Spanish period to the American period to the present republic, no? The forming of Christian conscience will always rely on the teaching of Christian principles. You call it um, you know, Christian living, you call it good manners and right conduct. No? The essence is still the same. No? Christianity in the way it should be lived by each one. No? So that's the essence of forming a Christian God. You know what is right from wrong and the teaching of the Ten Commandments. That's basic. That's basic. Without the Ten Commandments, we cannot talk about morality. No? So the way they did that is different from our time. The time it was memorization and discipline. No? You know? And today, it's more on a curriculum based on information rather than formation. That's very sad. No? They just study the, the course just to pass you know, the course and graduate. So in other words, from... The, from the notebook, from the book to the head, but it does not go to the heart. So it's more on information rather than formation. That's why, yes, many are graduating from Catholic school, Christian school, and yet the way they live is not, does not reflect no, the spirit of their alma mater. No? That's the tragedy of today. Okay? So there's no, the, 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 the difference is the approach, but the same principles of the Christian teaching based on the word of God, especially the Ten Commandments, to know the right from wrong. No? Without this, no, it's hard to talk about Christian conscience. That's, the, the, that's my answer for now. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Father. Uh, we have a question uh, again. Uh, Something I hope you don't mind this question, Father. No problem. Many questions. my best of my ability. Uh, actually, we get this question a lot, so I might as well ask it again. So, are you aware, Father, of any tunnels under the Colegio that connected it to other convents in Manila? Yeah, that's a black legend, always. No? There are no tunnels, no? mind you. No, the only tunnel that we have to uh, is the Malinta Tunnel of Corridor. That's all the tunnel that we know during World War II. But there are no tunnels interconnecting all the convents in Intramuros. Remember, uh, Intramuros was built on sand, on sand near the seashore. No, it has to be reinforced. No, but if you dug a tunnel, the first thing that you will see is what sea water coming out. No, that's why. Uh, tunnels, these are created by black legend in order to what? Spice up the story about the religious orders, the beatas, etc. No, remember, no, there were Masons at that time, no, who were anti-clerical. They would like to concoct stories, no, which we call black legends. It's our black legends, no. No, uh, during the liberation, no, the, the only tunnels that were this uh, that were you no know, were the tunnels and dug under. For under Fort Santiago, where many of our compatriots 
were killed by the Japanese. Those were the tunnels, no? There were dungeons, no? In Port Santiago, but connecting to ano to Intramuros, none. Remember, Fort Santiago is the last line of defense because it is facing Pasig River. So when almost of Manila in 1762, when it was invaded by the British, no? Uh, the, card, the, the Archbishop Antonio Rojo, the Archbishop of Manila acting as governor, delegated his authority to Simon de Anda. And mind you, they did not escape through a tunnel. They escaped through Fort Santiago by rowing a boat along Pasig River so they could go to Bacolor, Pampanga to continue their struggle against the British. So there were no tunnels in Intramuros. There were basement, of course, but they are not tunnels. Iba ang basement po sa tunnels. No? So let us be careful about black le black legends. Talk talk negatively about about the and these were concocted by anti clericals, especially in the 19th century and in the 20th century. Up to now, they are still persisting. For example, the the revolution, the katipuna, the katipunan was discovered through a breaking of the seal of confession. And there was not such thing a break of this. There were that the, the, there were witnesses that there was no confession, and yet they still persist through a prayer, oh, broke the seal of confession in order to reveal the katipunan oh, in the diario de Mane, in Tondo. So see, the persisting we might say black legend continues because they are they spice up the imaginations of others. Mm. Oh, remember, they are chismology, not history. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for that. <laughs> now we have a question from Raymond. No. Is there a way po to access records of the Colegio? My great-great-grandmother from Cayabas allegedly studied or was sent to Santa Rosa in the 1890s. But how do we verify? Unfortunately, we cannot verify because the, all the records from the, from the Spanish pit were burned during the liberation, during the, ano, the bombing of of Manila by the Japanese. Nasunog po ang ang Beate, ang Kolej de Santa Rosa. So, I do not know if there would be copies. If there you have to check the National Archives or the Arso, Arso, uh, the the archives of the Arzobispado de Manila, the Arcam, not the archives. You might check on on, on it, no. But the the archives or uh, the documents of the Kolej de Santa Rosa were all burned during World War II. So there are no two possibilities to retrieve. Either you go to the National Archives or to the Archdiocese and Archives of Manila in Intramuros. They might be available still, but I'm not so sure. Thank you. Thank you, Father. And uh, thank you to all our participants. Now, let's wrap up this uh, open forum. Uh, Father, uh, the Pule di Santa Rosa is a pioneer and a pillar in the history of public instruction and education in Philippine history, in the Philippines. So with all her milestones and achievements, what do you think is Santa Rosa's greatest contribution to our nationhood? The greatest contribution that Santa Rosa has given to our nation is providing Christian women, mm. Christian women who became leaders to our, to our nation, who became mothers no, to our Christian families. These are the greatest assets of the Colle de Santa Rosa de Intramuros. I do not know their names, but I believe whenever you hear me, you are the greatest assets. Without you, there is no Colle de Santa Rosa. That's my, my message. Thank you, Father. That was a very wonderful response. Oh. Father. Okay, so let's wrap up na po. So uh, this ends our 74th episode of the Intramuros Learning Sessions. Now I'd like to promote our social media channels. We are in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And in case you missed this episode or you came in late, do not worry because this episode is uh, going to be uploaded in our YouTube channel. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button. So siguro po mga within this week, mga upload na namin. And of course, I'd like to uh, advertise our page at the Google Arts and Culture. So our museum collections, the museum collection of the Intramuros administration, most of them have been digitized already and available for viewing in our Google Arts and Culture page. Now, to uh, just to just to conclude, 
our webinar po. Father, do you have any final message po? My final message is that let us continue the legacy of Madre Paula de la Santissima Trinidad. That as Osirisan would say, true liberation comes through education. And to the young ones today, education means not just information, but transformation. The transformation, the transformation of the mind that will also transform the heart will lead to the transformation of the society. So transformation begins in oneself before you could transform what is outside of you. So let us be ambitious. We cannot transform the whole Philippines, but we can first transform ourselves in a way we should live as Filipino citizens today. Thank you. Maraming salamat, Father. And maraming salamat sa ating mga participants. So until our next uh, intramural learning sessions po, so stay tuned po for our next announcements po. So stay tuned na lang po. Thank you ulit, Father. Maraming salamat po. Thank you din po, Sister Vicenta. And thank you din kay Sister Grace. Thank you. We love you po. This Father, thank you so happen. much. Okay na. Ay, pwede na mag-sign off? Yes, okay. Father. Uh, sa mga nagtatanong po about the certificate, so we are going to provide certificates to those who will respond to our feedback forms. The feedback form po will be emailed to you po. So don't worry po, meron po tayong certificates. And of course, Sister, uh, Sister Eva Grace, uh, sa mga nanonood po dyan sa room, kung gusto po nila ng certificate din, pahingi nila po ako ng list para magbigay din po ako. Maraming salamat po. Thank you so much.